Okay. How's everybody? I'm good. A little busy. Are you busy? Yeah. Okay. Today is Accepted Students Day, and there's going to be a tour coming around. Uh, and so that's why uh, everyone is looking beautiful today. Um, glad you got my note and uh, took a shower. Um, but, uh, no, really, the, um, I'm going to bring a group around, uh, at, uh, before the end of class. So, um, let's do a quick lecture because by now you guys know what the deal is. We're talking about cities in a very specific way, uh, in a very specific architectural way that, by now you're very expert at. Um, so we can move through this material quickly and efficiently and effectively. And then I can give you time to work on the term project. Specifically, there are huge advantages to, uh, instead of waiting for Wednesday uh, the 10th to look at what everyone is doing and figure out how we're going to win this contest. There's a huge advantage to think about how we're going to win the contest and then collaborate uh, in the development of the term project so that we arrive on April 10th with a collaborative effort with all the pieces complementing all the other pieces to um, result in a killer, knockout punch, award-winning proposal. And uh, I've been talking with our potential collaborators, and we were talking about where in the world, what part of the world is in the worst state right now? Survival-wise? Well, money is uh, an indicator of other things. So, yes, money-wise, and yes, survival-wise. You know, like all the flooding that's going on. Right flooding? Uh, where's flooding going on? Um, oh, in the, in the U.S., like, it's like around Minnesota area. They said it's like the worst storm in um, the Eastern Hemisphere. Never heard of it. Really? I've heard of Minnesota. Well, like, it's going on, like, currently, like, this oh. past week. Really? Yeah. Bless you. Thank you. Um, okay. Refugee crisis in, like, the Middle Refugee. That's a good one. I like that one. That's really bad. Because a lot of the refugees are climate refugees. Uh, because the Syrian... Did you know that the, have you heard of, do you know what the word Syria is? So there's this place. You guys are so busy, you don't have time to read the newspaper, right? There's a place that's called Syria. And there's a huge war there. It's basically one of the clearest examples of climate change refugee warfare. It's triggered by drought, famine, climate, driven by climate change. Um, and the, it's currently one of the biggest sources of refugee displacements in the world. Um, so Syria, Syrian refugee crisis is a good one because it's climate change. That's what your careers are all about, dealing with the mess that my generation uh, gave you. Sorry about that. Good luck. Um, what the refugees in the war period, the IS? What is it? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Islamic State. Uh, the Islamic State um, takes advantage of uh, dis displaced peoples very effectively. Hezbollah has a brilliant scheme. What they do is they hand out money to people. Brilliant. 
uh, put that in, on the menu of possible, uh, possible measures to take. It's very effective. U.S., when it wants to win over the hearts and minds of people, they offer aid, but the aid comes with forms in triplicate and uh, lots of strings attached. I experienced this after the tsunami, uh, earthquake and tsunami in Sumatra. Uh, I went over there. I, I just went um, and uh, connected with a, a bunch of groups through the networks, my networks, and um, ended up uh, doing what Hezbollah does. There are billions, tens of billions of dollars flooding into Sumatra after the tsunami. And um, you could access that money if you were a major corporation from the same country that was donating the money. Um, and, or if you filled out lots and lots of forms and fulfilled all the criteria. But the end result is there were tens of thousands of, of victims who were not being helped at all. So I collaborated with, I became part of a network of person-to-person -person aid where I collected money from friends in the United States, uh, my co-housing community and my networks, and I just took that money, put it in my bank account. And then I went to Sumatra and I cashed it out and gave people money. Uh, no strings attached. Uh, it was basically, I was giving it to the orphans whose parents all died in the tsunami so that they could pay their school fees and keep going to school. Um, very effective uh, action to take. Giving actual loans to the orphans. Yeah. I, I handed them envelopes filled with cash. Crazy. Wouldn't it be dangerous to hand in a large amount of cash to the orphan who doesn't know how to use it? Uh, apparently, no. <laughs> they just, we just wanted to get them school uniforms transportation money and school fees because public school costs money in most parts of the world. Just to go to school in the global south, you need to come up with like $20 a month or something. Insane amount of money for, from these people's points of view. Uh, and that's basically what we were giving them. This huge en envelope stuffed with $20 and asking them to use it responsibly. And trusting that if they decided that they had some other needs that, that were more important than going to school, that they're probably in a good position to understand that. And they were in a protective environment of a village society, so, so that was okay. So, yeah. So here's what we came up with. Have you heard of this? It's called Venezuela. So we're thinking Venezuela. It's in. It's a failed state. It's got, uh, despite the fact that it has uh, the most oil in the world, it's number one or number two in terms of oil reserves. It's got a corrupt communist dictator hanging on to power by bribing. Uh, several hundred soldiers to surround him at all times so that he doesn't get killed, uh, just waiting for one of those soldiers to get bribed with even more money that will kill him. Um, and the world is holding its breath, waiting for the moment when this guy gets assassinated, um, which uh, I'm uncharacteristically rooting for sooner rather than later because in the meantime, tens of thousands of people are are leaving Venezuela, going to Colombia, going to Brazil, being subjected to horrible conditions. A lot of them are dying or being thrown in jail or suffering tremendously. There is a, a new president of Venezuela who's ready to take power. And uh, we have connections because of Manuel Delgado directly to the transformation of the city of Caracas, Venezuela, the capital. And so, uh, I'm suggesting that that's the target because 
we actually have a chance, a very attractive opportunity to impact um, how Caracas and Venezuela rebuilds itself uh, when this guy finally gets shot. And that's the only way he's going to leave power is if someone puts a bullet in his brain. Okay? I'm not suggesting that anyone here do that. Um, he was like refusing aid. Yeah, because he was saying it was a U.S. plot against him. So people are going hungry because the aid is being stopped at the border. Uh, in, you know, the price of a bottle of water, um, between the time I walk into the store and the time I get to the cash register, it might go up uh, 50% because the inflation is so runaway. And the only way you can maintain, you, you can't have cash you have to transfer it all to Bitcoin, some international, some other currency, because if you have it in uh, Venezuela and Bolivar, it loses its value faster than you can spend it. So avoid, uh, when you travel to Caracas for vacation, don't do that. Um, but if you did, don't, don't transfer your money to Bolivar until it's time to spend it. And then pull it out of the ATM and give it to the cash cashier as fast as you can because it's losing its value every minute. So it's an insane situation. And we have lots of friends there. And uh, this would be a very attractive uh, proposal from the point of view of the jury. Um, so what does that mean in terms of what examples you look for? Probably nothing. If you're interested in electric bikes in Bangkok, um, well, here's what it does mean. We're looking for positive examples. We want to be Singapore about this. Okay, so let's look for examples that work and study them so that we understand how they work well. Where are the success stories? And then, uh, at a, as, and that's what you present uh, April 10th. That's what you read about. That's what you analyze as successes. Because we have a common disaster that we're dealing with. If you were thinking about electric bikes in Bangkok, think about, uh, you would naturally have to think about where are electric bicycles currently working well. Brooklyn, all the delivery people is a pretty good spot. But where are electric bicycles doing good things? Where are bicycles doing good things? And thus electric bicycles. So um, look at positive examples for your analysis. And look at positive examples for your reading. And then our job over the course of the next three years when we win the contest uh, is to figure out a way to translate and apply it to Caracas first and then Venezuela more generally. And then based on that model, the rest of the world, uh, so we can win the 21st century. Okay. Is that any questions, comments, suggestions on that direction? Yeah. It's not really a question, but after you talk about the terrorism in Venezuela, how does it differ from the situation in Nigeria? Ah, as soon as we uh, uh, test these ideas in Caracas and refine them uh, based on the specific conditions that we find in Caracas, that then becomes the next Medellin Colombia, the next uh, paradigm model for how to overcome the challenges of the 21st century. And then uh, when the North Korean situation opens up so that when Kim Jong-un or uh, his, uh, you know, his descendant or the person who you know, some future ruler of North Korea invites us to help them recover from the mess, um, we'll have a, a model further refined and developed because of all the changes we had to make as we implemented in Caracas. Now, Caracas is completely different from Pyongyang. So how are you going to translate it? Who are you going to call to translate it? You're going to call the architects. So let's do it first in Caracas. 
and then we'll take it to Lagos. Uh, we'll take it to Pyongyang. We'll take it to Minnesota, if they're still having flooding problems. We'll figure stuff out. Okay. Sound sound interesting? Okay. So let's do a quick lecture, and then we will uh, work in groups to... Who's part of a group? Okay. Who would like to be part of a group? Wouldn't that be nice? So um, this is kind of networking. We'll do the lecture, and then we'll work on that networking, figure out who should be with whom. Okay? Any questions? Okay, the lecture. How, how was the reading? Who spent uh, too much time on the reading? Who spent too little time on the reading? Come on. Who spent too little time on the reading? Just two of you are going to admit to spending too little time on the reading? You spent, so maybe you spent too much time? Not too much. But enough. Yeah. But more than you wanted to. So in the, uh, the Cronin reading about Chicago, mm -hmm. that was a little difficult, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, do you have any questions before we get started? Or how about this? Well, do you, if you have any questions, let's ask them now so I can gear the lecture to answer them. Or, as we get into Chicago, uh, please raise your hand and say, I have a, that's my question. This is my question. Okay? All right. Thank you. So the city as a machine, we're going to look at Greece, Rome, and the United States. And then when we get to the United States, we're going to look specifically at this interplay between space and uh, economics, which is something that keeps coming up in this course for some reason. And then we're going to look at Chicago as this very powerful example of how all these things work together. So uh, this is something that's come up before. <clears throat> When we draw a map, it's like we're drawing the existing conditions of a building. If there's a mountain here and a river here and a valley there, we document it as best we can. Uh, we used to use um, our eyes and our hands. Now we use satellites and drones and all kinds of high-tech things to make those maps ever more precise. And so we think of mapping as an exercise of capturing what is out there. It's the world is what it is, and when we map it, we're just documenting the world as it is, right? But sometimes it's not. It's something else. So remember this example? What's going on here? On a, have to do this with the roads. on a not square planet. Right. Yeah. So you have to do this to uh, pleat. I don't know if you sew, but in sewing, when you when you're trying to wrap a flat two dimensional fabric around a three dimensional form, you've got to tuck and sew seams, and this is one of those tucks. Does anyone sew? There we go. Tuck, right? And so we end up with this um, condition, and lots of people die when they go straight instead of turning. But what you're going to do? So this is a case where the drawing, the mapping, is the generative thing, and the world takes the form generated by the mapping. So it, 
it flips the relationship. The dominant, and usually we assume that mapping is uh, a passive act. You are passively simply reflecting what is out there in the world, but sometimes our abstract models and our, our human systems, we draw the map and then we implement the map in the world, and that's basically what architects do. And so that's the first question on this uh, in-class exercise. What is the scale of architecture? So what is the scale of architecture? It's multiple scales, right? You yeah. said the structure it depends on the purpose of the structure. Right. So it depends on the purpose of the structure. You know, so you, you, do this, you set the scale according to what, you're, what problems you're trying to solve. And who's the client? Right? Who's the client here? Uh, it's a continental project. It's a collective nation-state building project. So it's a big scale. So let's look at Greece. Uh, Greece is, forget about current Greece. Uh, I want to talk about Greek civilization and Greece as uh, a phenomenon in history of form making. So the, the Greek mythology established uh, a certain religious relationship between human, human uh, endeavors and the gods uh, that occupy places in nature. And so there was a very strong tradition of sensing and uh, evaluating how the gods are located spatially on the natural landscape. And the, the landscape of Greece is dominated by islands and mountains and barriers. And it's this, who's been to Greece? Wonderful, right? What, what's your impression of Greece? Is, just let's say a few things about Greece, those of you who have been there. Beautiful, right? <laughs> Look at that. So uh, the relationship between architecture and the landscape was very famously uh, written about by Vincent Scully, um, the professor of architectural history at Yale, when he talked about how the religious beliefs and the relationship uh, between the gods and the landscape are really what uh, were the driving forces, not just between, uh, not just in the production of this remarkable architecture that we still work with today. People are still designing architecture that came directly out of this tradition of design and construction. But not just the architecture as an object, but the architecture of placing these architectural productions within a landscape, altering the landscape ever so slightly and placing them in the landscape. It's a very, uh, it's a wonderful book and I recommend it. His name is Vincent Scully. <clears throat> and the mobilization of forces, uh, the, this is the oracle, this is the temple of the oracle of Delph Delphi. And uh, the geologists have found that there's a fissure below this leading to an underwater aquifer <clears throat> that, where there are collections of methane and ethylene gases. So it's likely that the oracle, the holy seer, the woman who could uh, see the future and predict war, the outcomes of wars and famines, etc., cetera, uh, that basically when you go to visit the oracle, uh, the oracle is sitting in this chamber, getting high on the gases emanating from the ground, and so do the people who come visit. So there's kind of a hallucinogenic uh, mechanism by which they get in touch with the larger forces of the universe and come up with these uh, predictions. Um, so Greece, um, Greece followed the lead of the Phoenicians, <clears throat> The Phoenicians, who were great sailors, also, they gave us writing and paper. Thank you, Phoenicians. Now, Lebanon. Um, and so the, uh, both the Phoenician and the, Greece, the Greek systems, part of the systems um, was 
expansion. It was based on growth, growth of trade networks. Uh, and uh, they did that by extending their reach and establishing outposts far away from home by replicating the model of their city. And so here we are, the central city of Greek civilization, um, 5th century BC, uh, before Christ, and we have, this is the model that gets replicated and extended across the Mediterranean in order to expand the Greek system uh, and its reach. And we still refer to Greece all the time because uh, we've inherited these ideals of democracy, of democratic institutions, glossing over the fact that um, there were slaves and there were, uh, that it, it was property owning men who ran everything. It wasn't democratic uh, by contemporary standards. But at the time, in the ancient world, it was radical because uh, it supported the idea that if you were uh, a property owning man, uh, you, you could uh, articulate an idea and others would listen. And if the idea was supported, it could rise up and actually have an impact on the world. And it's not just a social political system. It is supported by the architectural instruments of the city. So the agora is still referred to um, as the public realm within which ideas can be communicated back and forth. The stoa is the architectural form of discussions that move out of the agora into the stoa uh, uh, that we would call Starbucks now. Um, but this is where the discussion goes. And uh, in the context of the temples um, and then the assembly hall where these ideas might rise up and actually have an impact. And so the roots of democracy uh, we associate, at least the story we tell each other, the culture we have constructed around Greece, it's a culture of veneration of democratic institutions. And so the architecture of Greece has been venerated as the architecture of democracy, in a way, which doesn't prevent it from being uh, appropriated for other things, up to including uh, Hitler, Nazi Germany, you know, it became just power. It's not dem about democracy at all. It's about power. Uh, and banks use it to, um, to exemplify uh, stability and dependability. Uh, and so this is just one of the several uh, hundred examples of architectural history where the origin story of an architectural form sometimes carries forward uh, very close to its roots and sometimes branches off into different directions. And Greek architecture is one of the <clears throat> um, most common uh, architectural legacies that gets used in other ways. The Greek theater uh, exemplifies a very clear relationship between the city at our back, the people who gather in the seats and the theater, the, the play as a, the morality plays that uh, are enacted on the stage in the context of the natural landscape. So behind the Greek theater, there is this often this vast, uh, picturesque, natural scenery so that we see with our backs to the city and culture, we uh, see the human drama play out and against the backdrop of the natural world. And so the, these mythologies and these stories and these uh, architecture as a vehicle of meaning, of propagating meaning, is embedded in all of uh, the Greek architectural arrangements, the architecture itself and the arrangements of the architecture. Now, as a system set in the landscape, the Greek system... Uh, dictated that there had to be certain elements of public discourse, the agora, the forum, uh, and later the basilica, uh, but also the theater, 
with the backdrop of nature um, and with the city behind it. But the, the key thing to look at here is the grid. So the grid is laid out uh, with absolute rigidity. Uh, there's a smaller grid here, which probably was the first original settlement. And then as the city expanded, there was a second grid with a different dimension. Uh, and the dimensions, again, as we've been seeing throughout the course, have an implication for parcel sizes and the architecture that can or cannot be uh, constructed on those parcels. And then there's the fortification uh, that reinforces the isolation of the peninsula so that, uh, uh, because every time you have a population uh, gathered together in a town or a city, you get a, a situation where you have uh, the, uh, uh, the accumulation of wealth. And so uh, hostile forces can come, and often did come, to take the wealth away from you and to take away the people uh, because we need we need money and we need slaves, uh, etc. And so uh, the world, and we take it for granted that that doesn't happen so much anymore. It happens a lot in isolated circumstances, but by and large, we don't need to have a fortification wall around Boston anymore. We're fortified by the threat of our nuclear weapons, and that turns out to be more or less enough right now. And so it's interesting to note the relationship between the grid and the shape, the overall shape of the city, which has more to do with the topography and the natural features. So just like we have a relationship between the theater and nature, we also have uh, a relationship between the city and nature. The, order, the ordered grid system of the city and the, uh, accommodating the natural setting. So it's a really interesting diagram of the relationship between humans and the world. And the rest is just multiple examples all over the world um, of Greek cities uh, set in a landscape with fortifications, the grid system. Uh, if the grid needs to navigate across a uh, topography, the streets become stairways. So all of these Greek cities are different versions of San Francisco. Who's been to San Francisco? Crazy, right? Why would they put a grid on that, on those hills? Greece. Same situation, same idea. I don't care about the topography. I'm just going to impose this grid relentlessly except for Lombard Street. Well, I think it's the uh, force will be forced. So the nature forced uh, the grids. Not nature forced the grids? Yeah. Explain that. Like, as you said here, uh, topography, um, so the architects came here, so the sites, and then um, they, like, throw some proposal of grids, and they have to follow the top of line. But the path doesn't follow the topo line, except in, it follows the topo line in section. In sections, yeah. Yeah. But in plan, I don't care. Yeah, that's right. From above, I don't see topography. Uh, so this is another example of an abstract model, a mathematical abstraction imposed on the highly not mathematical world. So if you compare that to city as organism uh, last week, it's a really interesting comparison. Uh, the forces of topography uh, are ignored in plan. And if we look at informal settlements, uh, there's always a path that heads straight down the fall line. Fall line, if you're a skier, it's the path that the water would follow if you dumped over a a garbage can of water, where does that garbage can of water go? That's, that's the fall line. And then perpendicular to that, uh, the paths follow the topo line, stay absolutely flat. So informal settlements 
are a counterexample to this, where they follow the topo lines in plan, and they follow the, the fall line by shooting a staircase down. This is the opposite, in a way. This is in section, right? In section, you, yeah, it, it, goes, it goes down. Even if, even if the topo line is going across here, it doesn't follow the fall line. It goes, it's the grid. It has to follow that line, so the staircase. Is not following the fall line, it's going down the grid line. I used to bicycle commute in San Francisco, so I have a deep appreciation for how this works. So, who came next, right? You guys took the history, history of architecture. Rome inherited the world of the Mediterranean from Greece, and Rome itself developed over the course of centuries in a highly disorganized manner. Um, up and down, there are seven hills of Rome. Uh, and so you get kind of a mess. And so this is the plan view of Rome with all of the familiar institutions of the Greek city, but with some new things added in. The Greek theater, uh, is complemented by the Roman theater uh, and the stadiums. So there's the Colosseum. Uh, I can't remember what that, this is where the horse racing, the club, what is it? Hippodrome. Hippodrome. Thank you. Um, the Piazza Navona, uh, the Capitoline Hill, the Apollo, uh, Quirinal. Anyway, Rome. And the walls around Rome, there's an earlier walled section that the, we don't see the wall. There's a later wall. But as Rome expands um, off the, um, the Tiber River, uh, it, as people move to Rome and settle just outside the walls, as those settlements outside the walls become more and more important, they have to extend the walls to protect those places. And so Rome, uh, like many places since, you see a series of walls until we get the Rome of the Noli map. Uh, and I'm sorry this is not clearer, but the Noli map is something that your studio professor, that's what your studio professor has been talking about. Remember when your studio professor said, you need to do a Noli plan. Right? So what did, what did she mean when she said that? It shows everything in the, in the plan. Yeah. It's a figure so. ground plan. So the solids are black, the spaces are white, but then Noli introduced uh, a new thing. He said, let's indicate the public spaces within the buildings, largely the churches. Uh, let's indicate those spaces, those interiors, those architectural interiors that are accessible, more accessible than the private spaces of the homes. Um, and what's that? The Pantheon. Um, Etc. Capitoline Hill, uh, Forum. So uh, the brilliance of the Noli map, and I should really put in a higher resolution version, is that you can project yourself into it. You can walk the streets because you're architects. You have this superpower in your brains where you can project yourselves and you walk down these streets in your mind. Right? You're walking down the streets and then, oh, the church. I'm going into the church. Here we go. Does it work? So you can't do that uh, unless you're given visual access to those interior spaces. You go in and you can go, ah. Right? So you experience the space in an only plan in a way you can't use in other representations. So this is not an only plan. It's more of a a Weldon Priest plan is what I call it. Do you know who Weldon Priest is? He is a former professor of architecture here at Wentworth who 
really revolutionized um, the way many of us think about and look at cities. Um, his website, uh, I'll, I'll share the, his website with you, but for 15 years he taught a course where students drew street studies uh, using a certain set, specific set of methods, including the Noli plan and street sections that um, really open our eyes to how the architecture of cities operates. Um, he was here yesterday, so um, he reminded me that his website uh, was up. So here's um, a Roman city in England. How, did, how, how's, how could there be a Roman city in England? Uh, and basically, you start with the ideal abstraction of a square grid city, and you accommodate it to the landscape, and that's what you get. And every Roman city, uh, every Roman city starts out as a camp, a military camp, and then develops from the, the military camp into a city. Um, name a European city, and I'll tell you if it was a Roman camp. Uh, yes. No. Prague. Prague, yes. Greek. Anything Greek? Uh, it's, well, it started out, probably started out Greek and then became Roman. But um, it's, a, it's an easy game to play and we'll, we'll do uh, the next part of it uh, as we move forward. But here's what they did is they would show up. The Roman army would show up and they would the first thing they would do is they would survey the land and they would establish their grid using these surveying methods and tools uh, they would measure it with a string and they would cite down uh, these uh, surveying tools uh, locked on these station points and this is uh, surveying uh, when you see Wentworth students surveying the campus it's more or less the exact same thing with slightly different equipment we have lenses and telescopes now, and we have lasers and digital, uh, but basically it's the exact same thing. And the word century means 100, and uh, their land division strategy was based on the units of hundreds. And so what they're doing is called centurization, and they were called centurions, uh, which is, has become uh, synonymous with soldiers. So the, it was a military practice to go to a place and to impose the abstract order of the Roman camp on the landscape. And it had to have the Decumanus and the Cardo, which you studied in History, in theory, history theory of Architectural One, right? Cardo, Decumanus. So Cardo is east-west, Decumanus north-south, and then in relationship to those two main cross streets, you have the market, the forum, uh, you put the amphitheater out of town, and then you have a new situation for the theater. Um, it's no longer at the edge with nature in the background, so you have a new typology. So these are all tents. This is the first settlement, which is a military camp. And um, the grid extends out of the city and onto the landscape. And so there's an extension of the north, south, east, west grid of the Roman system. And there are streets. Uh, remember in the movie Alf, where, what's his name? I always get the, it's not Ben Stiller, it's... Ferrell. Will Farrell, and he's going across the street, and he he's, he hops from one white stripe to the next on the crosswalk, like a child. I'm not going to do it. No, <laughs> um, but he was right. It's not that he took this class and he knew about that. It's that it's just natural is what you do. You hop from one to the next. So this is a drainage system that uh, allows pedestrian. So the streets are, are simultaneously for wheeled vehicles. And the, so the wheels can pass between the stepping stones. 
And also, it's a drainage system. So we often have raw sewage flowing in the streets, and in a rainstorm, the uh, streets become canals, and you drain those off in these drains, which is still more or less how we do it today, except for the raw sewage part. We're starting to separate raw sewage from, well, we're not starting. We've been doing it in the U.S. We've been working for decades to spend the billions and billions of dollars to separate drain waste wastewater sewage from the drainage water. And that's how we cleaned up Boston Harbor. And that's what's going on at the edge of campus. Uh, that sewage collection thing in the middle of our campus, did you notice that? Um, that's part of the system that sends raw sewage out to Deer Island, where the big uh, digesters are to treat the sewage before uh, draining into Boston Harbor. That's how we cleaned up the harbor. Uh, they also uh, were amazing engineers. Um, the, you remember from architectural history that uh, uh, the Greek trabeation, remember that word? It's trabeated. That means you separate the vertical structure, the columns and posts and bearing walls, from the horizontal structures. The posts, I mean the beams and the lintels and the slabs uh, of Greek architecture. Uh, and they use trusses, they use timber trusses as well. Well, the Romans uh, introduced the arch. And so from the arch, we get the vault and the dome. And so that's the big, you remember all this stuff, that's the big distinction between Greek architecture and Roman architecture. Roman architecture is an inheritance of Greece with the addition of uh, arches, barrel vaults, and domes. And because of Mount Vesuvius, the volcano, they uh, discovered that when you mix the ash from Mount Vesuvius with water, sand, and gravel, you get, what do you get? Concrete, yes, thank you. Um, then we lost the recipe. And we didn't discover it again until 1825. So con we had no concrete between um, the fall of the Roman Empire and 1825. Interesting fun fact. Um, a lot of these illustrations are from David McCauley, who uh, studied architecture at uh, Rhode Island School of Design before becoming a children's book illustrator. And he was fascinated by his history of architecture courses and has done a lot with cathedrals. And here's the one about Roman architecture. Uh, that they had to very carefully calculate how much drop the aqueducts, um, how much they dropped every mile because if they dropped too fast, first of all, you would um, you would run out of uh, you wouldn't reach the city with your water because it would hit the ground before it reached the city. So you tried to keep the water as high as you could for as long as you could. But if you don't pitch it enough, the water won't flow. If you pitch it too much, it will erode the mortar. Uh, and grout, uh, it'll erode the system so that um, uh, it destroys um, the engineering. So they had to very carefully calculate the pitch of these things. It was a very sophisticated engineering um, thing. They also were brilliant engineers of roads. Their roads, our roads, are an uh, inch and a half of asphalt and then whatever, which is why they fall apart. It's part of the capitalist system of planned obsolescence. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, but Roman roads are still in existence. They're so properly engineered. There's the section of the Roman road. Uh, and European roads in general are over a meter deep, uh, whereas US roads are less. Um, so the Roman road system was another part of their expansion. You've heard the term, all roads lead to 
to Rome, yes. Uh, and here's uh, the great empires. Uh, and really, when you look at these colored shapes, don't be fooled. It makes it seem like uh, everything within under this colored shape is equally civilized and controlled. It's a lie. Don't believe it. But this is a representation of the reach of the trade and taxation networks. So using roads, Chinese trade and taxation systems were able to expand deep into Central Asia. The Indian trading networks uh, covered this area, the Persian Empire, uh, and then the Roman Empire uh, at the year one around the birth of uh, Jesus. And so uh, there's the aqueduct in the city of Rome, but what a mess. And the Romans seem to feel like, well, we can do better than this. And so that's why they took these main elements of Roman architecture and they deployed them. Um, now the theater is not directly connected with nature. Now the Roman theater puts architecture uh, in the backdrop. Yes? So can you go back to the aerial? So that, why was that such an unstructured sort of layout to the city in comparison to like the Greek method? Because um, that's a lot more like the Muslim model than the sort of grid system. Well, even uh, well, the uh, the Greek model we were looking at is not Athens. Right? Athens is the ancient center of Greek, uh, the Greek uh, city state, and it it uh, emerged incrementally over a long period of time by people adding things in whatever form they thought was right, and so. When Greek uh, armies went out to establish outposts, they said, we can do better than this. Let's use that grid thing that the architects came up with. And so they set up the grid thing uh, that was accommodated to whatever the topography and the natural forces of the site were. But back in Athens, it was kind of a mess because they're stuck with what they're stuck with. Once, once you make the street network, it's hard to change it. We saw that in London, after the fire of London, they said, oh, great, let's make a Baroque axial city in London in 1666. And all these architects said, okay, I've got, I, I know the right system to impose on, the right pattern to impose on London. In the end, uh, Sohn said, Sohn had his own pattern, and he said, listen, people, the property lines, the roadways, the wells, the infrastructure, the drainage, it's so expensive and so hard to change. Once you establish those patterns on the ground, you just don't change it. And so London was rebuilt more or less the way it was originally built. Same with Athens never changed, even though as the Greek system expanded, they used grids. Same with Rome. Rome emerged incrementally like an Islamic city, according to the forces of relationships, uh, what works and doesn't work locally for housing, for uh, the temples, for uh, the individual elements. It's a piecemeal decision-making process uh, with weak zoning controls uh, and, and, and weak layout controls. And here we are in Boston, right? The streets of Boston were laid out uh, as cow paths. First and foremost, every once in a while there's a grid when we fill in Charles River to make the Back Bay. Right? We have uh, limited episodes of grid-like order. And in the end, Boston is just what happened. You can trace the history of the development of Boston in its pattern of streets. Same with Rome. Same with Greece and Athens. Uh, but as each of these cultures expanded, to take over the untamed wilderness, quote unquote, they imposed grid-like systems because it works. It's just an easier model just to say, okay, here's some operating instructions, 
go do that. You didn't, you know, it's low paid labor. Just go do the system. Don't design anything. You don't need an architect. Let's just send the centurions, the surveyors, uh, to the technocrats to implement this model. <clears throat> so that's the machine. It's an excellent question. This is the machine part of city as machine. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And so uh, Rome needs to expand its empire. Uh, and so it sends out the centurions. Uh, they march and they conquer the next town, and they subjugate the people who are just building whatever they're building according to the topography and the forces of nature, as if uh, it's they're making piecemeal decisions, and they demonstrate their cultural superiority by imposing an abstract model, mathematical model, on the landscape. Um, and it's symbolic of the uh, story, the narrative, that these primitive peoples are subject to the forces of nature. We come in, the Romans, and we impose order on nature because we are the masters of the world, us Romans. We don't need to <clears throat> deviate our roads or our street grids because of some pitiful little force of nature. We impose it on nature. And there we go. And the people who are enslaved by the centurions, um, uh, the centurions, as soon as they've established a, a camp that then becomes a town, they become the masters of that town. And the enslaved people become the soldiers of that town. And then they send out those soldiers to the next location. And so it's a franchise model. It's a brilliant uh, it's not capitalism, but it's, uh, it has that kind of viral tendency to, as soon as you take over a place, you train them as soldiers, and then you send them out, and they take over the next place. It's like a pyramid scheme. So they get wealthy by uh, taking over the next place. They collect the taxes in the name of the emperor back in Rome. They keep their share, and then they send the rest down the road network back to Rome. That's how empire works. That's how empire worked back in Rome. That's how it's more or less the outline of how empire works now. Except we're, we use oil uh, and other things. So here's uh, a very clear example uh, because of neglect. It's uh, in Algeria, the north coast of Africa. Um, so you see the road network expanding throughout the Mediterranean world and up through the British Isles. That's how a Roman city ends up in uh, England. I'm not sure how accurate that is. I have my doubts. But here's the general uh, timeline of expansion. So Rome is expanding. They take over city after city. And this first phase of conquest takes almost a thousand years, I mean, 600 years, six, 700 years. Um, and then, so this becomes what we now call Italy. And they, they continue their expansion uh, around the Mediterranean world, east and west. Um, Hispania is the Iberian Peninsula, now called Spain. Gallia is France. And we cross at, uh, um, to the British Isles. And North Africa, the Middle East, and into uh, pushing back against the Persian Empire. You know, all the different peoples of what is now called Germany. There's, that's the town we looked at previously. Uh, Scotland, Hadrian's Wall is down here. These people were so insanely violent, uh, Mel Gibson, etc., that they withdraw back to Hadrian's Wall, um, which is a beautiful walking tour between Glasgow and Edinburgh.
and then things um, start to shrink a little bit. So walls work, to quote our president, or at least they worked back then. And so here we are at 407. What happened, uh, we just skipped over this part, but Emperor Constantine uh, converts to Christianity in 325, and Rome becomes uh, the Holy Roman Empire, and thus the Catholic Church. And even as the fall of Rome occurs, we have um, the Byzantine Roman Church that lasts longer, uh, centered in Constantinople, now known as Istanbul. And so here we are in England. This is kind of uh, the core of the Roman system, um, accommodating the existing settlements. Here we have Lake Como in Italy. You see the Roman camp, the fortification, is still very clearly imprinted on the city of Como in Italy and the subsequent expansions. And you, you know, so the grid more or less prevails in the center, and then at the gate you turn towards the next settlement. So there is some accommodation of landscape. Uh, if there's a lake or a mountain in the way, you head towards the next settlement in a direct, direct line. But within that, you set up a grid. Uh, here we are back in North Africa, a very clear uh, system of the Roman wall. The city rose and then shut down. Uh, and so uh, you see that first Roman wall without all the accumulation of stuff around it. And there it is, the aerial photograph and the original plan of Tim Gutt. And this is uh, Florence, Italy. Right, there's the Brunelleschi's dome. So um, who wants to try to trace out the original Roman settlement in Florence? Go ahead, Haley. <laughs> and it's going to get harder because we're going to do, you're going to have your chance. Right here? Yes. Survey says? Exactly. Okay. Then... <laughs> Then people started to settle outside these original walls, <clears throat> and as they became more and more important, they had to be protected from the marauding hordes across the landscape who wanted to come uh, enslave and pillage this Roman town. Where's the next wall? Who's Let's see what we have. Nope, wrong, wrong direction. Yes, congratulations. Okay, and so on. They settle outside this wall and become important enough to be protected. Who can show us where the next wall was? All right. I'm not sure. You're not sure. But and what if you're wrong? I can't see this fine. And let's see. Yes, exactly right. It's getting harder and harder, though, right? So, what are some of the clues? What are some of the things you look for? Larger streets. Yeah. Another code on the wall. <clears throat> so, who wants to try the next one? Okay, Jenny, <laughs> our next contestant. Can she do it? And you can help her out, right? You can shout from the from the audience, right? Some game shows you can do that, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. Um. Can she do it? Oh, oh! What do you guys think? I think further. So the first part, I think you got. Yeah. Well, that's definitely. I think it ends at like the same note. That the other one ended on. Let's see how she did. Um, pretty good. That's pretty good. 
And uh, now they're enclosing the river itself because that is a position of, of vulnerability because of boats. And, we, and the game could go on city after city. This is Cologne. Uh, sometimes it's part of France, sometimes it's part of Germany. Um, and can you see it? We can, and you can see out here, and then, and then at a certain point we get to Haussmann in Paris, and we get to Vienna when they removed the wall in the mid-19th century, and the whole new part of Venice, I mean Vienna, it, uh, designed by Camilo Cite, is all in what used to be the fortifications and the fields of fire because you needed to have a clear shot at the enemy as they approached your city wall. And so you need to keep the fields of fire open. So here we have um, the Italian landscape and the remnants of the grid are still there. The Roman grid is still the dominant pattern on the landscape of Italy. And you see it in the farm fields. So let's move to the United States uh, system. And we looked at this, right? I'm having trouble remembering. Did we look at this in this class? Or History Theory 2? We may have looked at it in like briefly in one of our first lectures. Yeah, it seems to me we did. Yeah, so this is Los Angeles. You might have looked at it when we were looking at Los Angeles. And it's like the Acropolis, right? When we read about Frank Gehry's um, Disney concert hall, that's on top of Bunker Hill, and it's like the Acropolis. Uh, it's called the Acropolis, I believe, in LA. And what came later was this US constitutional, well, it's not constitutional, but it was, who invented it? We saw this. We've seen this multiple times. Did it come with the interstate system? With, uh, no, it was before the interstate system. Here's a hint. It was 150 years before the interstate system. So it was established by uh, the second president of the United States. Your high school teacher is going to hear about this. Who is the second president of the United States of America? Yes. It was. So Thomas Jefferson, the architect, right? He said, hey, how do you like my Monticello? Pretty good, right? Monticello, we say. What do we say? Monticello. Monticello, okay. Um, how do you like my Monticello? I'm going to give you uh, something bigger, a bigger piece of architecture. Uh, I'm going to give you a grid. And so the United States, west of the Appalachians, uh, were subjected to the land ordinance of 1787, I believe, the year. And that land ordinance is what gives us the United States of America. Um, you studied Radburn Garden City, where the school children get, you know, they can get to school by going out their backyard to get to the school. But wait, that's not a, that, what, what, what is that? Is it a garden city? What is that? Can you see what that is? It's a suburb. What's in that green space? Golf it's a golf course. So instead of deploying the Radburn model for school children, where's the fun in that? I mean, where's the money in that? Let's deploy it for golf courses. Works beautifully. There's an interconnected network of golf cart paths where you can get to the clubhouse in the parking lot of the golf course. Uh, and so this is the system that is imposed uh, across the United States. Um, and you see these things littered across the continent that establish the, the station points for the survey. 
you get the tucks and pleats uh, to make it fit over the curvature of the earth. Uh, and you use this to quickly uh, populate the wilderness, the empty wilderness. There's absolutely nothing there, right? There's nothing there in that wilderness, just waiting for us to just occupy it. But wait, there is something there. There are the several hundred nations of uh, the First Nations of North America that came somewhere between 20,000 and 15,000 years ago and populated the entire continent. And so this, this painting makes it really easy for us to kind of make fun of uh, the whole U.S. cultural project of colonizing and then vanquishing the, uh, the peoples of the original natives of the U.S. and claiming that uh, we Europeans are the natives of the U.S. And so no one believes that except us in, here in the United States. You kind of have to leave the United States to get a clear sense of the genocide that makes this whole system possible. Um, and you see um, a misogynist uh, attitude towards women, uh, the conquest of technology. She's stringing the telegraph cables, uh, the settlers force forging westward, followed shortly by the rail system, the ships. This is Boston Harbor, the Brooklyn Bridge connecting back to New York and the darkness of the wilderness and the darkness of the, the savages are being driven off the landscape. And Chicago. So Chicago, uh, using the grid, Chicago is commoditized. It's, the land is made... It's parcelized so that here in Boston and in New York you, and in Baltimore, uh, people could buy and sell uh, property in a place that they've never been near uh, because every parcel is the same as every other parcel. And the speculation of this uh, land grab commodification was insane. It was kind of like Venezuela in a way where you'd buy a property in the morning you could sell it in the afternoon for twice the price. And so it was a bubble. It was a real estate bubble. And Chicago, there were cities all up and down the Mississippi River who were competing to be the new gateway to the West and the place of, of collecting the resources. Uh, and Chicago won. It, could have, it should have been St. Louis, uh, but that would have favored Baltimore. But the, the power of the New York financiers drove the competition such that Chicago became the winner of this contest. Uh, and so New York, Chicago became the thing. Um, and so because I have to end the lecture very quickly, the punchline of all this is the grid system is a gigantic architectural uh, machine for commodifying the land and its resources and the people who settle on the grid. It becomes a giant organizational strategy, not just for the land, but the resources and the populations, so that it becomes like the Roman operating system. It's a, it's a tool for collecting resources whether it be cattle, timber, corn, wheat, etc., and bringing it through the grid system, through uh, points of collection, St. Paul, um, I can't remember, Iowa City, uh, and Springfield, uh, and St. Louis, uh, and bring it into the concentration point of Chicago, where it is then redistributed to the rest of the world. So you have wheat and pork and lumber and et cetera being brought in, the raw materials being brought in, processed, and then distributed to the rest of the world either by ship or by rail. And Chicago becomes the architecture, the architectural mechanism by which 
that is achieved. And part of it is the vast scale of the landscape with its grid and its land. Uh, this is the, uh, the land rush uh, where they said, um, forget about the Native Americans. We're pushing them to, to homelands, Bantustans, South Africa style. And we're going to take over um, so that we can uh, civilize the landscape through our grid systems that then become a road and rail system. Uh, that uh, extends from sea to shining sea um, along these railway corridors and telegraph corridors. And Chicago becomes a giant machine for processing uh, these raw materials uh, and the architecture of Chicago, very familiar, uh, becomes the, the last stage in that mechanism of processing things and we look specifically at the slaughterhouses that with the technologies of refrigeration and refrigerated cars allows us to instead of having a butcher shop in every town you walk the cow to the town and then you slaughter it and then you have fresh meat for the whole town instead Chicago becomes the butcher shop for the world because of refrigeration and so you have industrial production of uh, meats, um, especially beef and pork. And, the, and so the grid of the landscape of the entire continent is reproduced in a smaller scale in the grid of the Chicago stockyards, which other than the Columbian World's Exposition uh, that we studied last summer, uh, this becomes uh, a major tourist attraction. Even though it smells like hell, people are fascinated to see these vast pens and the slaughterhouses, the industrialization. So the animals walk to the top of the building, you hook them on a chain, slit their throats, and the weight of the carcass is what drives the machinery of the entire factory. As the carcasses move down through the, the mechanized systems. It drives all of the machinery uh, of, the, of the slaughterhouse system. And you have the architecture that celebrates and becomes the focal point of the tourist attraction of the Chicago stockyards. So any questions? OK. So now...